We're live. Are we live? My we are live. Oh my gosh. Okay. I'm so glad your internet's faster than mine. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> my computer is still loading. But we are live, Stephen tells me. So we're going to go. I want to introduce everybody that is following this page and following this interview. If you do not know, this is Mr. Stephen Hilgart. Uh, he, I first heard of him. He spoke at one of our ESP uh, conferences last uh, March. I think it was March of last year we had it. And he is an amazing speaker. He's very inspirational, has a great inspirational story that I had to share with all of you. It led him to what he's doing today, which right, right now he is a uh, coach for Tony Robbins. And he's going to talk about the things that happened and, and how he overcame because it's an overcomer series and brought him to today to what he's doing to help other people in their lives right now. So I am so thankful that you are doing this with me. So thank you, Stephen. I'm thankful to hang out. This is going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's, it, it's been funny because it's coming up on near seven years with Tony now. And, uh, you know, I've basically lived out of a hotel in a suitcase for, for years upon years, but, uh, I was much of a, I was a big traveler before that too. So I kind of just sold everything and packed a suitcase and a backpack and just freaking left. That kind of so, sounds like heaven to me though. I love hotel rooms. <laughs> it's, it's, I don't know. It's, it's a blast. It's not for everybody. Cause a lot of people are like, yeah, I'd love to travel. And then they see that like, I only own a backpack and a suitcase. They're like, wait, like, how do you, how do you survive? Like, <laughs> it's, it's funny that way. Seven years is a good long time. You're looking great because you look super young to be doing this coaching for seven years. Um, so that's good. That's always nice. You can oh, tell by the giant bags under my eyes. Oh, there. let's not talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so tell me, what, let's talk about introduce yourself. So where are you from? Tell me a little bit of your background. Yeah, so I guess I can just give the, uh, the whole story in a nutshell, but uh, I'm originally from Minnesota, from Minneapolis, um, uh, born and raised. On the playground is where I spent most of my days. Uh, anyways, just kidding. But uh, so I guess the story really begins. My cousin was a world champion kickboxer and I wanted to follow in his footsteps. So I joined karate at like six, seven years old. And uh, I just got obsessed with it. I got pretty good. By 16, 17, I was flying over the world, flying over the country. I'm fighting the adults because I had beat all the teenagers that they threw at me and I was still winning. So imagine scrawny little white boy from the hood. I'm knocking out adults and I'm doing really well. Uh, but at this point, there was no UFC, right? There was no NBA contract or NFL contract waiting for me. There's only two options. Open a karate school, become a teacher, or go be a movie star. So I'm sure you can take a wild guess what I wanted to do. <laughs> um, and uh, I ended up moving down to Chicago where the rest of my team was training with this idea of pursuing this entertainment thing. So, you know, the, the it, Discovery Channel, ESPN, History Channel, um, you know, Midway Games, the Mortal Kombat series, and <laughs> Um, you know, live Vegas shows and all that sort of stuff. It's all really cool and exciting. Sounds really cool. But basically it was, I signed a bunch of contracts that said they can use all my stuff and not pay me anything. So I end up in this strange city, no family, friends, money, savings, and no real passion for the entertainment industry. But I just, I felt like I was going to do it because that's what all my friends were doing. And I felt like that's what I had to do. And I, I just found I didn't love it, but I couldn't go home a failure so I stayed in Chicago and I ended up homeless for about two years. Two years. I slept in the back of my car. I slept on the floor of a karate school. It was, yeah, it was almost two years. And uh, long story short, you know, lots of depression, sadness, frustration, upset, um, and just really struggling to try to find myself as most young adults do. You know, I was what, 18 at this point, 18, 19. Um, and just, you know, trying to figure out where's my life path. I wasn't going to go to school. I wasn't going to go to university and just trying to figure out my path. And it was a little rocky. Well, until 18, what's that well so 18 19 year old like let me just explain because there's people watching you that are going to be like well i mean you're still a baby we think we're grown but we're still babies we're still kids at that age and i had to live i i was a couple months um homeless in my car oh, and wow. i it was it was uh you know i i the, I, I think probably it, my faith was strongest at the time i don't know how i think you know it was, you know my belief in god carrying me through it all but I think, how do you handle two years at eight? I was not 18. You, know, you have, a, you know, you're just barely an adult. How does an 18, 19 year old mentally handle that? I mean, obviously the depressions, right? But what did you do when those nights, there had to be like times where you were just like, you just felt hopeless. I mean, how did you get through it? Because I, I deal with that. I actually just recently had a gentleman come at me and say, I lost everything this year. You can't be positive all the time. I'm like, you know, it's a mindset. No, you can't be, you just cry it out you know, but then pick yourself up. So how did you get through it? 
Yeah. I mean, the difference is not staying there. And, and here's the funny thing. We, we talk about homelessness in America and that's, you know, now that I've traveled the world, I mean, I'm so grateful for being homeless in the United States versus in Thailand or versus, you know, somewhere else where it's like, okay, uh, there's, there's a lot worse places. If you're in poverty in America, you're in the top 1% of the world. So I never starved. I, I, you know, I, I was never wanting for food and stuff. There were nights I went hungry and stuff like that, but it really, it wasn't that bad. I know that sounds crazy, but for someone in that situation, it's not just about being positive, but it's about perspective. Yeah. And when you understand that it's really not that bad and the, you know, the, the day always follows the night and, you know, spring always comes after winter. Like that's just how the world works. It happens. But you know, it's, it's so fascinating to see when someone is stuck in that zone, it's hard to talk them out of it. And you know, from the Tony Robbins world, like you, you can't do something unless you change your physiology. You got to change your emotional state because the problems that you created in that emotional state of like depression can't be solved in depression. So you got to change the state, whether that's happiness or excitement. Sometimes it's just pissed off. You get pissed off enough. It gives you the energy to go do something. You know what I mean? One of my favorite quotes that he said, and I'm paraphrasing, but uh, one of the, something really like this was, y- I'll tell you when you're going to change. He says, you're, everybody's going to change, and I'm going to tell you when you're going to change, when you get sick and tired of your own shit. And it's true. There's a point where you're just like, enough, you know, enough, and, and it comes to a head. And, and so, but you were 18, 19. So where did you get the perspective to like view things like, okay, this, um, they, the days are still going. I'm still moving. Yeah. And you know what, it, it, you said at the beginning, kind of like, you know, what, what brought you through, but at the beginning, it wasn't bad. It was like an adventure, you know, because I was like, Oh, I'm going to go be in the entertainment industry. I'm going to go be a movie star like my friends. And I'm going to go do this and I got to pay my dues and that's okay. I'll sleep on the floor of a karate school for a while. I'll, I'll you know, I'll do this. I'll do that. I'll figure it out. And at the beginning, it was like exciting. And then what I didn't quite realize, and I think my father figured this out before I did, you know, he was like, you're an idiot. Why would you do that? You're stupid. Don't do that. And of course, you know, most men spend their entire lives trying to prove themselves to their father, right? So I'm not going to go back a failure. I'm going to show him. And, but the thing was, I didn't realize I hated the entertainment industry. I thought it was just the stupidest thing ever. And I didn't, like, I had made this decision because my friends did it. And, you know, some of these people I was with, they would slit your throat for a toilet paper commercial. Ooh. Like, dude, you can have the toilet paper commercial. I don't care. <laughs> like, that's a, it was never exciting to me. But what I did find, once again, was my passion for teaching. And so my, my, my rent was basically, I was sleeping on the floor of the karate school and I'd teach the classes. So uh, a gentleman down there, John Sharkey, uh, Sensei Sharkey, we call him, um, you know, he, he did a lot for me in that world. And he really, when I went down there, he was like, listen, you come down here as a kid, but you need to leave as a man and you need to change how you think and how you feel. And there's a lot to the story, but because of the depression, because of the frustration, I made some weird choices. I did some weird things and I just kind of pulled away from everybody. And, and then, you know, I'd, had the opportunity to sleep in the school and I slept in the car instead. And I had the opportunity to go to dinner with people and I didn't because I felt guilty. Like all these weird things that we all kind of do at times. Mm -hmm. But fast forward a little bit, it's about two years later. It's February in Chicago. It's 30 below zero. I can't sleep in the car that night because it's too damn cold. So I'm walking through the Barnes and Noble in Naperville, Illinois. I'm walking through the self-help section thinking this is stupid, why the hell am I here? I wasn't there to read, I was there to stay warm. I was there to kill some time. And I see the book on the shelf, Awaken the Giant Within, Tony Robbins. And, uh, and just, you know, whatever you want to call it, divine intervention, the universe talking to me, but it's 20 bucks. And I got one last $20 bill in my pocket. And that was my food money for the next two weeks. But I made that decision to buy that book and life never was the same. You know, things started to change. I read it again and again and again and again and again. And uh, it's still kind of my Bible to this day. This is Tony, yeah. Awaken the Giant Within, right? Yeah, I love that book. I, you're making me want to read it again because it's been a couple of years, but I remember, yeah. So, so you're reading that book. So lots of great tools and nuggets. What, were, what was one or two things um, at that time? Because I know the first time when we read something, I like when we read a book, sometimes it hits us different when we're at a different place in our life. So yeah. when you're reading that the first time, what were some of those whoa moments that you got while you were reading that book that you're like, this hits home, like this is it? 
You know, I'll tell you, and maybe it even sounds a little over dramatic, but it took me a while to go back because whenever someone asks that question, I got to kind of replay like what actually happened and what was the timeline and, you know, because you never remember things perfectly, but um, I do remember this part perfectly. I was reading that book in a parking lot of the Fox Valley Mall in Naperville. I'm sitting in the parking lot of my car. I'm reading the book. I'm sitting in the back seat of the car. I got like three jackets on me to stay warm. And I'm reading that book. And I remember the first couple of sentences, like the first couple of paragraphs. Tony's describing how he's flying his jet helicopter from his castle in Del Mar, California to his seminar in Los Angeles that's sold out and everything. And I'm like, this asshole, I, I've made a huge mistake. Are you kidding me? But the next couple of sentences, he says, I stopped my helicopter above a building that I recognize. And it was a building that I worked at as a janitor just 10 years before. And he said, listen, most people overestimate what they can do in a year, but they underestimate what they can do in a decade. If you make some choices right here, right now, if you decide to stick with me, you read through this book, you do the lessons, you learn this stuff. I promise the next 10 years are going to be different in your life. And I always look at these movies where like, like people are shouting out to God and here I am shouting out to Tony Robbins. Like, dude, if you can help me figure this out, I'm going to help as many people figure it out as possible. Yeah. And, um, that's, that's what it was. And I, I just remember that moment, like making that promise. Like if I can figure this out, I'm going to help as many people figure it out as possible. And, and obviously it's been, you know, what, 16 years or so since then, but uh, Sorry, I'm you know, emotional because I'm just like going through my own. So I'm like, oh, <laughs> you feel it. Right. I mean, that's how yeah. I feel like every day. I'm just so grateful. And it's, yeah. it sounds so silly to look at one man as like, Hey, here's this guy who like changed my life or whatever, because there's so many other characters that played a role. You know, my father was a big influence. Tony was a big influence. Jim Rohn was a big influence. Zig Ziglar was a big influence. Mm -hmm. um, but long story short, after I kind of read that, I like some things clicked. I moved back to Minnesota. You know, I worked a bunch of jobs, saved up a bunch of money. I started the karate school ended up being one of the largest in the country, uh, did pretty well, sold that uh, a few years later, moved to China, because um, why not? I wanted to go travel and see things. And then I moved to Latvia and I was, you know, about 65 countries. And then I started two other businesses and kind of worked on those. And now I'm on business number four. Um, and I'm, um, you know, the top trainer for Tony Robbins. So, so you go from, I'm reading this book and it's changing my life. And what was one of the first big steps and change that changes that you applied to your life? That was like, okay, I'm just going to, you know, I'm living in my car and I'm not, I'm going to start a business. Like what, what, what were the, what fell into place? That's always the funny part about everyone's story, right? Cause everyone, it always seems like it's overnight. Like there's like this movie montage Right. And I don't know what this was, but like for most of my life, I always thought like, uh, you know, this book, when I opened the karate school, maybe you can relate to this. Please tell me if you do. But when I opened the karate school, I remember walking in and the studs are up on the, on the, you know, the walls aren't even up yet. The studs are. And I remember walking in when these guys are building this, I was just crying my eyes out because I'm like, I finally made it. Yeah. And I'm so dumb because I literally yeah. thought that the book would just close the end. That was it, happily ever after. And I'm like, that was just the beginning of my problems. <laughs> I was sitting there thinking like, <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking, but I was like, oh, that will be it, okay. I love that. No, that's good because that's just real life. Like, yeah. you no, know, it, it is, it's, it's, I mean, it is. It's like, you did make it, you know? It's like, you know, you don't know everything that's gonna come with it. We don't always know. Um, but you did, I just saw a sermon, a friend sent me the other day and he was talking about beta mode. And it was a, he shared with me this, uh, and I shared it to my Facebook, but it was a uh, pastor teaching about a lot of times we're in, in beta and we're in a beta phase and we don't even know. And we're thinking that's it. And we're thinking, and we don't want to get out of the comfort zone. You know, we don't want it because we're, you know, this is amazing. This is beta and this is, but we don't know all the bugs when we're in beta mode, all the different bugs that have not been worked out to get into, you know, the next phase of where it's going. So, so that's just part of the journey. We have to be able to, to suck up the, the, the bad with the good. I think yeah. as long as it keeps going in the right direction, though, that's just the way I see everything. As long as I'm every, it's a little bit better, you know, or I, I compare it, you know, like for me with my health, I, I have to compare month to month and year to year to see it. So I'll compare that year to year and it's like, oh, like thank God I'm not where I was last year. <laughs> you know, thank God. So you started your karate and then you're, you're somewhere decided to go to China and you're traveling the world. How did you actually link up then with, with Tony? Um, again, it's, it's hard to piece all these stories together all at once because so many things happened throughout those last 15 years. But yeah. <laughs> uh, after I sold the karate school, 
Um, and, and what was so funny about the, the, the larger part of the stories, there's so many little mini stories that are involved and, and, uh, it's so challenging to tell stories. I don't know if you've experienced this, but it's like, if you say too much, it's like really boring if you give too much detail, but if you don't say enough, you sound like a liar or whatever, but so much happened that, you know, I had kind of a rough relationship with my father growing up. Like we, we were just too similar. We just butted heads constantly. I moved back from Chicago I got no money. I was homeless, living out of my car. I worked five jobs. I slept two hours a night. And uh, I remember one job I would sleep for, like I would, I was teaching a kickboxing class at 4.30 in the morning. I would teach that class, sleep for 15 minutes, teach a second class, drive to my next job. And then I would do that like just constantly. It was crazy. And then I realized like I couldn't save enough money to open the karate school. I needed about $100,000. I knew I needed to borrow money, but nobody would lend some dumb 19, 20 year old kid money. And so I asked 28 different people and uh, the 28th person was my dad. And he signed the loan. He helped me build the school and all this sort of stuff. And we made that decision to sell it years later. And he's like, you got to go find what your next thing is. So I was like, all right, I got to get out of here. So I moved to China. Things are going pretty well. I had a buddy of mine who a uh, really close friend of mine, uh, his name is Bobby. He was living in Estonia and he moved back to the US, sold all the stuff and moved back and went to Latvia, Eastern Europe. Yeah. Uh, for those guys not familiar, right on the border of Russia, yeah. Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Belarus, all that, uh, all that area right there. And uh, I, my dumbass, I'm on this side of the world anyways. Why don't I fly from Beijing to Latvia? It'll be a short flight. 18 hours later, I land in Latvia and Eastern Europe and I fall in love with the place. He and I get into a business together where we do offshore asset protection, corporate services. He still owns that business. He's, he does incredibly well. Uh, but we started to do these educational conferences where we would teach people, how do you live overseas? How do you travel? How do you, you know, it always sounds really cool and scary, like James Bond or Jason Bourne, like second passports and yeah. offshore bank accounts. But it was basically, here's what it was. Doctors who wanted to retire to Costa Rica. <laughs> you know, like that, that was basically what it was. One of those doctors happened to be Tony's acupuncturist. Wow. And he said, hey, you love Tony Robbins. They're looking for people. Why don't you go? And I was like, dude, I'm sipping mojitos on the beach. I don't need to work right now. I, I'm done working. I've worked too hard. I've done this. I've done that. And he comes back. Him and his wife are harassing me, both of them. And then eventually my visa is up in Europe and I have to come back to the US. And I'm like, what do I do next? And I threw my hat in the ring. And you would think again, happily ever after. Nope. It was six months of rejection, another six months of, of nonstop interviews and training and all this sort of stuff. And, and they just beat the hell out of me. But that made me the, the speaker and the trainer that I am today. So I'm so grateful for that process too. So I, I heard you speak a, a little bit. You, you, I only heard you once say it and the times I've heard you speak and you just kind of brush past it. Um, but I just feel like, especially the times that we're living in, the people they don't know what they don't know. You know, I think some of us, especially if, like we grew up in hard times and suffering, we know how to get through it. And the more we've been through it, the stronger we, we get from it because we know we, we can do it. But there's people that are experiencing things for the first time all over the world that they've never had to experience. So, um, it, you know, and, and especially these t these days where like teenage suicide rate, rates are up and, you know, our military and this and that. And I lost my mother to suicide. Mm -hmm. So I had heard you talk uh, once a little bit about you kind of had um, a moment, you know, like with, I guess it was when you were homeless and when you're going through all of that. So what was, I mean, do you remember, can you, it was a while ago and I get, but can you pinpoint a time where it was just like, like this, like hit like that road and I can't do it and how you able to just pull yourself out of that? No, wait, never mind. Like, I'm not going to go there. You know, it's, that's an interesting question because it, when, I, when I really think back on the actual situation, in that homelessness or in the challenge, in that, that, that depression or whatever, suicide wasn't an option there, but it was as a teenager. And as a teenager, there was a couple of times where it was damn close to me just not being here. And there was something that happened as a teenager that I just kind of snapped out of it. And I decided that that was no longer an option. However, I was willing to be absolutely miserable, the most miserable I can make myself and be depressed and be there, but I just wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting to see what people do and what they won't do and what answers they come up with. But, you know, I didn't even drink at that point. I didn't, never did drugs. Like that was never a thing. And, and uh, I'm in that world and in that position, you know, but I just, uh, 
I would just feel sorry for myself. So you, again, you know, the Tony talk pretty well. It's like, it was my way to gain significance and to feel love and connection was to go inside and feel sorry for myself. Mm -hmm. And that was my way to feel love is just to feel sorry for myself. And uh, yeah, yeah. I got so addicted to that feeling that I just stayed there all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, suicide is an interesting thing. I've, I've dealt with a lot of kids, especially at the karate school that were suicidal and, and uh, turned them around, you know, just because of what I learned from Tony. Um, but realistically, you know, it's, it's, again, it's perspective. The last 20 years have been so damn good. And people, you complain, I mean, people complain, they whine and bitch and moan about who's in office or who's this or who's that. But at the end of the day, the last 20 years, Everything has just gone up and 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 up. And now we have one normal year and people are like, it's the end of the world. Oh my God, we're all going to die. Everything. Listen, I've had some family, I had some friends affected by COVID. I understand it's not a joke, but at the same time, it's not the Spanish flu. It's not the the pandemic of of the 1900s. It's not, you know, uh, it's not nuclear winter. It's not, I mean, yeah, yes, some people have died and perspective wise over the last 20 years life expectancy has gone up another 10 years uh 80 of the world who were in extreme poverty are no longer in extreme poverty um, um you know feeding america and, and feeding the rest of the world i mean things are starting to change starvation is is being wiped out i mean they're building the the wall of trees in africa there's so many good things that have happened in the last 20 years that people just kind of blank on it like oh yeah. nothing good has happened yeah and there's not enough. I, I think that's something I try to do for the most part. I, I know just when I express myself or anything, um, like I, for instance, I won't even put a negative review on a restaurant if I don't like it. <laughs> thinking about that. I just won't post about it. I'd right. rather post about the restaurants I really like, you know, or do I really like to go? You know, I don't want to hurt anybody. So I don't want to, you know, there's enough of that. And what's going to be, is if they're really bad, they're going to go out of business. Maybe I just don't like it. That's okay. <laughs> But I really try to keep things positive, and it, it, it's you know it's exhausting. It's just, I can't imagine being negative all the time. It's just exhausting seeing it, getting that yeah. energy from some people. Sometimes it's like, oh, I can't handle it. I can't handle it. So it's where, definitely interesting. Where are you? I mean, you have a pretty great life. What do you want that you don't have, and what changes do you like? What What do you want that you don't have, and then? Where do you um, see yourself going? What are the things that you really like? What is your purpose? What do you feel your purpose is in this life? Well, of course, you go to date with destiny with Tony and you got to come up with your life's purpose, right? The purpose of my life is to be, do, have, and share endless joy, possibility, humor, and excitement and possibility, right? I mean, that, that's, it, it's, it's always coming up with that, that little mission statement. But I'll tell you, specifically, my goal was always to be the next Tony Robbins. I wanted to be like that guy. And now that I've been around him for so long, I understand I will never be Tony Robbins. And the reason I say that is simply because like, there's something, Tony will do anything for anybody anywhere. He will stop and he will go change your life and all this. So he's it transcended to that Mother Teresa, Gandhi freaking level, Martin Luther King level, where he will do anything for anybody and he'll sacrifice everything that he has to take care of to help someone. I've really found that's just not me. I love to help people, but I love to help people who want help. Yeah. And so that's the major difference between Tony and myself. And I, I love the mission. Like I will do everything in his stead. Like I'm, I'm going to be, and I will behave like he does here, but eventually my business is a business training company. So I, I teach people how to build their business on a scale. Um, and I believe that, you know, I, I hate how everyone has kind of uh, uh, degraded this term of like, pull yourself up by your bootstraps or whatever. It's like the most negative term now and ever. But I see a lot of people that I grew up with that are in poverty and they don't have to be. If they just learned how to build a business, if they learned how to create something for themselves, instead of giving a man a fish, I want to teach man to fish. Love that. And, that's, that's my big life goal right now. And uh, so my company is called Scale and I'm, I'm building that to the point where I can just teach that. And really what I'm after is to help entrepreneurs double their business, triple their business, to show them what's possible, but also they can create more jobs. They can help more people. They can build a better community. They can give back. They can do all of these things if they have those resources. So, so and I can help them. Somebody that. coming or they have an idea and they have a business that's not doing so great or they have an idea for a business and they're they're just not um, making it. How do they get a hold of you, and where do they go to, to 
you know, see if you can help them, if it would be a match for them. Um, you know, I, I'm going to be doing some some big challenges and stuff, and I'll do a bunch of free stuff recently. But I've got this little Facebook group. It's just literally just started recently, but it's uh, called Scale and Success for Entrepreneurs. So okay. people can join in there. Um, but ultimately, you know, if someone hasn't reached that level one yet, some of the stuff that I teach is a little bit too advanced. So what I always recommend people, if you've not been to a Tony Robbins event, I mean, go to an Unleash the Power thing, go to a business match, go to a date with destiny somewhere along those lines and just experience that. Tony just did the uh, the new world, new you challenge, which is great for a lot of people. If you're just getting started and you're trying to figure things out, rarely does personal income exceed personal development. So if you're trying to build a business, you're trying to grow something, you got to grow yourself. Yeah. And you know, in the martial arts, we always talk about the black belt and the kids would come in and say, can I buy my black belt? No, you can't buy a black belt. You know, go down to JC Penny and grab a black belt. No, it's who you become in pursuit of that belt. It's who you become in pursuit of that business. That's where the change comes in. I love that. I love that. I, I love that. And I love, uh, for me, I think, I'm just thinking about your karate because just the discipline, I think anytime anybody puts themselves up to it, like a challenge, whether it's military, a sport, anything that you go all in, in your heart, you know, and soul, you're going to challenge yourself. And I think that. I think everybody needs that somewhere in their life. If they don't have something that challenges them that they're passionate about and um, that they can stand up for, then they feel lost. So I, I, would, I, I would recommend anybody to find something, whether it's dancing or, or you know, karate, jiu-jitsu, hip flexing, anything. You know, find something that you can, you know, release and dis- uh, uh, discipline yourself. Be passionate about it. Um, yeah, something. Uh, Anything. I've not been to a Tony Robbins conference yet. So what the fiddlesticks? Oh, and you've no. studied his stuff more than probably anybody. I love reading his books because I can just download Audible. But, yeah. um, but so which one should I go to first? Well, which Unleash the Power Within is one month away and it's virtual. Which so you're is- freaking going. We'll take care of that. We'll figure that out. <laughs> but um, is- Unleash the Power Within. Oh. March 4th through the 7th, that's coming up here. And that's, that's always like the flagship seminar that Tony teaches. We're probably going to have 30,000 people on that, on that seminar. So it'll be exciting and really cool and, and uh, it's life-changing. So will we be able to hear you there too? Uh, I will not be speaking. No, I'm going to be attending. So it'll be my 25th one. 25 um, times I've been in the same exact seminar. But I freaking love it. I love it too. Michael, my, I would love, I, someday, someday I'll meet him. But... I want him to just, yeah, shallow how me and just kind of like, you know, put his hand and be like, this is what's going to happen. And that doesn't work that way, but I still see him like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Demons be gone. Yes. <laughs> think, yeah. But here's the best part. And I know a lot of people say that and a lot of people want, they're like waiting for that permission for someone to give it to them, like Tony or somebody else. And I've done it too. So I'm not, I'm guilty as every other human being. Like, man, if, he, if Tony would just say this to me, or if he would just do this to me, but what if he never does? Yeah. And one of the things that, that he says, he's like, listen, I teach coaches and all these people all over the world who will use my stuff and be really good at it and everybody else, but they'll never use it for themselves. Yeah. So the one thing that I noticed when I read those books and everything, Awaken the Giant Within, for anybody who's actually read that book, it's a massive book. It's like 800 pages. And the real challenge is there's an exercise like every other paragraph. Mm-hmm. And I actually stopped multiple times and did every exercise in that book for myself. Oh, wow. And that was the difference that I feel made the difference for, for me versus a lot of other people is that Tony will even say things in that book in passing. Like, oh, I did this one exercise this one time where I did this and this and this. He doesn't tell you to do it, but I stopped and I did exactly what he said. Wow. Every single book he mentioned, I went and read that book. Okay. And like everything. So I just worked on myself at the same time. So yeah, you may never have Tony to like grab your head and be like, ah, his hands are freaking huge, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, we can do it to ourselves. So anyone who's listening, anyone who's paying attention to this message, guys, please do it for yourself. Thank you, Stephen. Is there anything that you, any nuggets that you want to leave with anybody that is watching or anything that you want to share that's been in your heart or something that you just feel like, you know what, I've been nine on this and I just have to get it out. Um, You know, one of the big things that I I don't get to communicate as, as effectively as I want to on a consistent basis is 
the real thing that's going to make this year good or great or outstanding for somebody is the level of training and the level of work that they're willing to put in. Not just the level of work that they're willing to work at McDonald's or Walmart or whatever, but the level of work you're willing to put on, on yourself. And you got to dig in a little bit and actually write down your goals and actually have a compelling vision and compelling future and read the books and do the things. And, you know, a lot of people, you know, when I, I say this silly story of like, okay, I was homeless, I built three businesses and I did this and that. I mean, in the background, I've been to 200 some seminars. I've read over 1200 books in areas of sales and psychology and business and marketing and, and copywriting and all of these other things. Like I've done the work. And what I think a lot of people right now are just forgetting is that you're going to have to go back and read the books and not, not today's crap. And, 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 and listen, no offense to any authors right now, but a lot of the stuff that's out there right now are just watered down version of the old pros yeah. Think and grow rich, the seven habits of highly effective people, how to win friends and influence people. I mean, some of these books have been out of print. I mean, some of these books that are out there that, that you should go back and read and study from the masters. Yeah. who really figured this stuff out long before this. Um, and uh, that, that's what I would tell people is like, go back to the masters and find someone who is amazing at this stuff and learn from them instead of studying from some kid on Facebook who's like, you know, I'm now 22 and I'm a life coach. <laughs> okay, I yeah. <laughs> what's that because i read five of those books yeah yeah i read five <laughs> books and i didn't even read the whole book and i didn't do the whole exercise but i did read the cover and i read the first chapter i know what's best for you in your life you know it's just like it's it's silly awaken the giant within cliff notes no. yeah yeah exactly um but yeah i mean even studying tony's stuff the material everything that tony read i went back and read Actually, at the old headquarters in San Diego, he had his library there from the beginning of his career. Yeah. And so every single book that's on the shelf has like his notes and stuff. It was the coolest experience I've ever had to go and like look at some of the books and see what he wrote in the margins and see yeah, what he thought awesome. there. It was so cool. But by studying what he studied, I start to come up with some of the same answers. And for anyone else who's out there trying to become more successful in business or whatever, go study what your mentor studied. You want to be like Elon Musk? You better go read everything that guy's ever read. You better go look at, and if you do that, you start to think the way he thinks. You know, if Richard Branson is one of your guys, go learn from him. If Sarah Blakely is one, go study who they studied and what they did and how they did it. And you, you'll learn so much and you'll, you'll actually be able to give someone advice if that's your goal to, as to become a life coach or to become this or that. But I love that. So, so Awaken, I would assume Awaken the Giant Within is probably one of them, but what are your top three books of all time, life-changing books for you? Of all time? Um, that one is so difficult for me. I hate that question because there's so many good ones. Um, Awaken yeah. the Giant Within is still kind of my Bible to this day. I've got some great ones behind me on the shelf. Um, one book behind me for anyone who's in business, who has a, a business running, The Ultimate Sales Machine is this red one here. That's by Chet Holmes. Um, I'm a big fan of that one. When it comes to personal development, one of my favorite books of all time is The Alchemist. Love that, um, love that book. Paulo Coelho is incredible. Um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Robert Kiyosaki. Um, I'll say this publicly. The guy's kind of a dick, but he wrote a brilliant book. Um, and that is still one of the best books I can ever recommend to anybody. Um, Unlimited Power is Tony's original book. It's quite a bit more detailed than Awaken the Giant Within. And there's a lot of stuff in there when it comes to neuro-linguistic programming and neuro-associative conditioning. Um, uh, Think and Grow Rich, I think I mentioned that one already. Um, every successful person I've ever met reads Think and Grow Rich once a year. I've read that book, but not once a year. I've read it three times. So. But I yeah. feel like I'm like I'm on the right track because I've read most of these books. <laughs> except yeah. for the first one you said was that Tony wrote. I'm like, okay, right. I can read that one. The but. Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Um, yeah. Still to this day, it's one of the most brilliant books ever written. Um, and it's just absolutely incredible. Um, and it's, you know, Stephen Covey is really dry, but he, I mean, he's brilliant. So if you get the chance to read those, and, and that's why they, you know, entire organizations base their training off of that book, you know, so it's incredible. But there's, oh God, there's so many. Give me, give me a category and I'll give you a book, you know. Well, if you were challenged by the last question, you're going to be challenged by this one. I love to ask people this because I, I'm, I'm writing my book um, and it, my life 
revolved around everything that happened. And my life revolved around love, what, love, understanding real, deep God, unconditional type of love, you know, that craving growing up and wanting that and just trying to become that mirror and trying to just see that in everybody and trying to see past the ego and see the God in everybody. You know, we're all connected, I believe. And so I just, I, I believe that is my purpose is to share that story. And, 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 and with that, my, my book revolves around music and my life revolves around music. And so I would love to ask people, so they're going to film a movie about your life. Okay, Stephen Hogarth, and they're doing a movie. What is the, the theme song for your movie? The one theme song. The one theme song? For your movie. movie oh, boy. Um, ooh, that's a good question. Clearly, I'll be played by Brad Pitt. Um, but uh, <laughs> beyond that, let me see here. Um, supporting cast, you know, some of Angelina Jolie and, and you know, stuff like that. But um, theme song tell that story (laughs) (laughs) theme song man god that is another really challenging one because i love so many different kinds of music i mean i I love everything um and uh you know i think there's certain songs that i mean it would have to be whole soundtrack same thing i can't live by myself to one come on challenge come on you like i know you like a challenge i love a challenge it is. Everybody gets stumped on this one, but I love it. All right. I'll give you a song. It may not be perfect for every part of it, but it's Under the Bridge, Red Hot Chili Peppers. How does that go? I can't think of it. Do you don't remember the song? If I hear it, it's been a long time, and I wasn't, wasn't huge Red Hot Chili. You, yeah, listen, I, you're going to have to go listen to it. Just go listen to it. Go listen to Under the Bridge. I'm a dancer. I'm not a singer. You don't want me singing it for you. I am the back an amazing, heart. amazing lip singer. Yeah, I, I, I perfect. Sing, TikTok know? is your style. Like, let's, <laughs> you got it. Awesome. Well, thank you, Stephen. Thank you. It's so such a pleasure much. to hang out. It is a pleasure. If you ever need anything, reach out. And, uh, you know, I'm over here in Colorado, but I'm honored and happy that you took the time to talk and share what you've been through and to help inspire other people. So, perfect. It's my pleasure. All right. You have a good day.